the Eagle Pisher Lead and Zinc Mine near Joplin, Missouri. Out of this mine each day come thousands of tons of ore that will produce the metals vitally needed for the nation's defense. We're all familiar with the uses of lead and zinc in peacetime as in time of emergency. But scattered through the ore in this truck is another metal with whose use no one is familiar because it hasn't any, at least not yet. It's gallium, the mystery metal, 43 times as expensive as gold. It's been half a century since gallium was first isolated from ore of the other metals in which it is found in faint traces. But only recently have the research scientists of American industry been able, through newly devised techniques, to collect the metal in any quantity. But at what price? $3,500 an ounce. Why this tremendous investment in refining a metal that serves no purpose? Because with its amazing characteristics, gallium holds great promise to the men whose job it is to plan for the future. Here we see a gallium nail pounded into a board. Set out in a warm room for a few minutes, that nail will melt right down at a temperature of only 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Reduced to a puddle by room temperature. What do this and other eerie facts about gallium mean? No one knows, but firms like Eagle Pisher and Alcoa have made the mystery metal available commercially, convinced that eventually industrial research will give gallium its useful place in the family of metals. What you just saw is typical of the new discoveries you see on Industry on Parade each week. Today, American industry is spending an estimated $750 million of its earnings in research to translate test tube and laboratory experiments into new and improved products. This industrial research benefits everyone in this country by giving us better and less expensive products, creating more jobs, and helping all of us to improve our way of life in America. Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing Company of St. Paul, a booming organization that develops new products so fast it's now producing more than 5,000 separate items. They're the makers of that familiar scotch tape, which now has taken on amazing new strength through the addition of fibers of rayon and glass filament. And here it is, filament tape, with a tensile strength of 500 pounds per inch of width. The tape is produced on jumbo rolls, four feet wide and hundreds of yards long. It has a backing of acetate film, better known as cellophane, and shock-proof rubber adhesive. It's in this adhesive that the filaments are embedded, just as steel rods are embedded in reinforced concrete. Here we see the jumbo roll being cut into small one-inch rolls. And what can the new filament tape do that scotch tape can't? Before we look into its wide industrial applications, here's a demonstration of one emergency use to which the tape is put by an ingenious young lady named Pat O'Donnell. Her car is really stuck in that snowbank, but with all her charm, it isn't long before a passing motorist pulls up to help. Neither of them has a tow rope, but Pat produces a roll of filament tape, perplexing the helpful gentleman no end. With much muttering on his part, the cars are taped together and watch this. One doubting Thomas doubts no longer. But the tape wasn't designed by Minnesota mining and manufacturing research scientists to pull cars out of snowdrifts. Among other uses for which it was intended is the secure packaging of goods for shipment. In the tumble tester, a 70-pound carton taped with just two short strips for reinforcement gets a banging it wouldn't ordinarily receive, even in shipment overseas. The shock a container must absorb on the longest of trips is duplicated in a few minutes. The corrugated container is battered and beaten, ready to give way at the seams. 
And it would have given way if it hadn't been for those two strips of filament tape. And here's Patricia again with another demonstration of the strength of this product of industrial research that's ready to go to work for the nation. For many American men, these are the items of wearing apparel that supply the only spot of color in their entire wardrobe. As you might imagine, this quirk in the personality of the conservative male citizen is not at all displeasing to the tie makers of the nation. Member firms of the Men's Tie Foundation are only too happy to blend the dyes that will bring a little sparkle into the appearance of the otherwise somber male. Here, skilled craftsmen, just a few of the 25,000 persons employed in the tie industry, use the silk screen printing process to bring to life the brilliant designs that originated on the artist's drawing board. The squeegee forces the dye through fine openings in the silk screen. If there are four colors in a design, four separate screens must be used. When the last color has been printed on the fabric, the roll goes through a steaming and washing process to remove the unwanted dye chemicals. You'll notice the designs are printed in blocks, with four designs to a block. They're printed on the bias to give the tie its resilience or give. After getting a final bath in pure soap and water, the fabric is pressed and emerges ready for the cutting table of the tie manufacturer. Now begins a series of operations in which the skills of highly trained workmen combine with the most advanced labor-saving machines to produce the finest product at a cost far below what it would have been without such coordination. Now the tie begins to take on the shape of a tie. The fabric is cut into three separate parts. The reason being that each of those parts must receive its own special treatment. There's a front panel, a back panel, and the centerpiece that goes around the neck and regulates the length of the tie. Very little fabric goes to waste. In the sewing room, silk linings are added to the front and back of the tie sewed on with a remarkable floating stitch that permits the tie to spring back into shape after it has been knotted. The necktie you might take for a relatively simple accessory becomes more and more complex. Here, for example, a cutter prepares thousands of woolen linings that will serve as the very core of the tie, giving it the body that will make it tie well and also help it retain its original lines through many wearings. The tie is folded over this lining and basted together, then sent back to the sewing table for the final assembly. Constant improvements in design and fabric finishing are credited for the steady growth of America's tie-making industry. Where in years gone by, a man might have had one tie for Sunday and one for use during the week. These days, it's a different story. For with 100,000 color combinations to choose from, American men now have ties in greater profusion than women have hats, and with about the same morale-boosting results. Here's a lucky little miss with a dollhouse almost big enough to accommodate her along with her dolls. But actually this dollhouse was built to demonstrate a truth about houses of any size. The fact that because cold air tends to settle to the floor, that is not ordinarily a good place for little girls or little dolls to play. But Mother explains how this house is different. It's equipped with a unique heating system called blend air. Clouds of vapor are poured in through the windows. Like cold air, it immediately settles to form a chill blanket on the floor. From the furnace through these pipes comes heated air. It goes right past the cold air grill, 
sucking in that cold air and blending with it to form air of comfortable temperature, which then comes out at the top of the room. Within a matter of seconds, that layer of cold air has been wafted off the floor. Thanks to new research by heating engineers of the Coleman Company of Wichita, that favorite play space for little girls, the floor, is just as warm as the rest of the room. In America, we can be proud of our four million business enterprises. Some are large, employing thousands, but most of them are small, employing from one to 50 employees. We need both big and little businesses in this country to supply us with all the products necessary in our everyday living. And during this period of stepped up industrial mobilization, businesses of all sizes are even more necessary in order to turn out all the vitally needed material to defend this country and its allies. Since the days when Mark Twain wrote his Life on the Mississippi, this has been a sight to strike a romantic chord in the hearts of Americans who respond to the traditional scenes of their country. The river boats, paddles churning, smokestacks puffing, and whistles sounding at every bend. They're part of America. But the river boats do not ply our waterways to supply us with nostalgic scenery. As always, they play a vital role in the nation's transportation network. Steel companies like Jones and Lachlan maintain fleets of river boats to carry their raw materials. And never was it more important than now to bring those raw materials together to form vitally needed steel. That's why some drastic changes are taking place on the river. Here at the Dravot Corporation Boatyard in Pittsburgh, Work is speeded on a whole new fleet of diesel river boats for Jones and Auckland and half a dozen other firms. The new boats incorporate every modern development, including navigational radar. The powerful diesel engines will push the boat and its barges along faster and at less expense. So the river boats are not a vanishing tradition, far from it. Today, they're ready to do a better job than ever of getting the goods to their destination on time with new sleekness and speed to grace America's historic rivers. 